<clears throat> Hello, today I am going to be reviewing the second album by British uh, singer-songwriter Imogen Heap. This album is titled Ellipse and it was released on August 24th, 2009. This album is obviously, as I said, her second, although some people could consider it her third as she did do an album with this in this group that she was in with Guy Sigsworth called Fru Fru. Now, Speak For Yourself was pretty much her first album. Um, in, as a solo artist, and this was her follow-up released four years later. And I've reviewed Speak For Yourself already, and I had a lot of great things to say about that album. And, you know, a lot of people look at that album as sort of being a little bit more strong, um, a little bit more of a classic Imogen record. But for me, Ellipse has something that's just very special and very sort of magical. I, I find this album to be a little bit more captivating sonically um, and I find the lyrics to be a little bit more interesting. I think she really sort of hones her songwriting craft, but also her DIY production style on this album. This album is recorded entirely by her. I mean, she, she won Best Engineered Album Non-Classical in the 2010 Grammy Awards, and this was a huge moment because this was the first time a woman had ever won that award. She did a lot of this herself, um, and she used a lot of, um, you know, at home sounds and sort of recordings to create the soundscape of this record, which makes it feel very domestic and very a little bit soft. Think of like Bjork's Vespertine. Um, this is kind of her Vespertine album. Um, and yet it does have those strong pop sensibilities that create really catchy hooks, really great songs that could easily do really well on the radio, like First Train Home and Swoon. And then there's those more sparse minimal tracks that are a lot more sort of hushed and refined. Everything is just a little tighter and a little bit, I think, well, better packaged. Um, and I, I really am excited to talk about it. The title of this album, Ellipse, comes from the distinct elliptical shape of her house, which housed her recording studio, which she kind of is sort of basically her basement. And she sort of turned into her makeshift studio recording in place. So this album was definitely recorded more at home. And that's why you have sounds like a faucet. Um, you have knockings on a banister. You have clinking of silverware. You do have some of these sounds and speak for yourself as well, but she really goes all in with more of these sounds. First Train Home is an incredibly relatable song to me, and I think to many people. Um, this is a very catchy, big, soaring song, pop song, and similar to Sound in Good, of Good Night and Go, which was a big successful single off of her first record, not really wanting to be where you currently are. So she sings about wanting to catch the first train home, I've got to get on it. Um, and she sings about being at a party, and she really doesn't want to be there. And this inspiration from this song literally came from a time where she really was kind of in the mood to write a song, but she wasn't entirely sure, and she decided she got invited by a friend to go to a party, and she took a train there, and the whole time she was thinking this was a mistake, I really should be at home writing, and then when she got to the party, it just became ten times more, like, intense for her. It was like, I shouldn't be here, I really got, it's, it's this frustrated feeling. I've definitely, I mean, not necessarily to write music, but I've definitely gone to, like, social events, I'm a very introverted person, so I would much rather be at home. And there's lots of times where I'm in a social event, and like even just this recently, I was at a party, and the whole time I'm just thinking, the first train home, I've got to get on it. Like, I just need a way out. I need an escape route. And it's that sort of desperate um, claw calling for that that becomes this sort of rush. And the song builds up by saying, you know, I need to get out now, 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 and then now, like, get me out right now. Like, this is an emergency. But it starts out very wistful, and I think the sounds are super airy and light. And again, it just showcases her beautiful vocals, her beautiful songwriting abilities. I mean, she writes lyrics like, Bodies disengage, our mouths, mouths are flushing over. Is this an echo game? Irises retreating to ovals of white. That urge to feel your face and blood rushing to paint my handprint. A frisbee one by one, your vinyl on laminate desperate for some kind of contact. A staple of Imogen's lyrics are these intricate word plays where she uses metaphor and allegory to craft exquisitely detailed lyrics that almost over-describe the situation to the point where it abstracts it. But you don't want it to be too overt because then it loses its charm. And I think the fact that they're always head-scratching lyrics kind of guises this whole thing in this sort of... Uh, 
mysterious but yet playful um, down to earth sort of sound. It's again, I mean, her songwriting is is immaculate, and her melodies that she comes up with are immaculate as well. Especially this song. I think it has some of the strongest melodies that we will see on this album. Definitely one of the most memorable songs. Another highlight song for me is "Wait It Out." This song is very hushed and quiet at the beginning and then builds up in sort of a more ecstatic kind of breakdown sort of towards the middle of the song before it kind of calms back down again. And there's this t uh, tangible boredom to the song, but it's, it's a pleasurable experience to listen to just because it's singing about being uninterested by something or wistfully remembering something like uh, days gone by or this frustration, you know, that the store sign is closed and you have to wait for it to say open. Everybody says time heals everything, but what of the wretched hollow, the endless in-between? Are we just going to wait it out? I first heard these lyrics and they just hit home so hard for me because Life oftentimes is very unexciting, and we look back at the past and we always see the highlights and we forget about all that in-between time, that time spent waiting for things to happen. I've heard it said that, you know, at the end of your life, you will always think life was too short, but while you're in it, life actually feels interminable. And it's because, you know, it's hard for us to live in the present moment and appreciate what is actually happening now instead of focusing on the future, a future moment that you can't wait to have happened or reminiscing too much on the past. I'm definitely guilty of doing this. So this song really spoke to me. I mean, she's singing about on the surface, a love or a relationship that's sort of not going anywhere and this sort of possible roadblock that they're gonna have to overcome. It's either going to separate them forever. Maybe they're in a long distance relationship and they're basically saying, look, uh, we're going to be apart for a long time. It may be a year before we actually see each other again. Is our relationship going to actually survive this? But beyond that, there's always things in life that you have to wait for. And there's always this sort of blessing. Patience is a virtue. You know, um, be patient because good things come to those who wait. But it is such a, you know, dif difficult thing to hear, especially when you're dealing with some depression and possibly things aren't going so well in your life. And you think, but I want results now. I want things to be better now. When really you have to kind of wait and sort of see how things unfold. But at the same time, you have to actively in the moment, enjoy the current moment. And that's how the future starts to become more positive. There's nothing to see here now, turning the sign around. We're closed to the earth till further notice. I mean, I just thought this is just so brilliantly describing, you know, a stagnant relationship or someone who feels as though they need to go into this sort of hibernation status where they're, you know, not producing anything. They they're, don't want the world to look at them. Um, we all go through those phases, especially in depression. And so all of these lyrics are just so relatable. And they're a little bit more transparent. This song is unique in that. They're still excellently crafted lyrics, but they're not so um, disguised in metaphor and, you know, uh, poetic description. Um, these, song, these lyrics get to the point. Um, they don't beat around the bush, which is important because it's a direct song. The song Earth is alluding to climate and um, environmental protection. Um, she's sort of personifying the character of Mother Earth. Baby behave, we'll make it work. Are you with me? I've tried patience, but you always want a war. This house won't tolerate anymore. Stop this right away. Put that down and clean this mess up. End of conversation. Put your back in it and make it up to me now. One can definitely see how this could be construed as Mother Nature talking to humanity, saying, look, I've tolerated you for so long, but if you keep doing what you're doing to the environment, um, I'm not going to be able to abide you in my house anymore. I'm going to have to cast you out um, because you're uh, a very messy tenant. There's one lyric, these Legoland empires choking out mine. Legoland empires, that's how she describes cities. And if you think about it, Legos are like, you know, a dumbed down sort of childlike representation of what society and like concrete in buildings are. And to describe them as Legoland um, empires is so brilliant and so clever. This song is more sporadic and it's, it's trying to be very upbeat, but it's a little bit more dire and a little bit more ominous. Um, there's not so much of that sweet 
an airy attitude towards it. Melody is not as memorable. Um, so it's definitely not my favorite, but I do find the message so endearing. Little Bird. This is a really cute song. I feel like it's a little bit more of like an interlude. It's very minimalistic. It's basically just this, you know, uh, synthesizer keyboard um, riff in the background. Um, it feels a bit like rain just falling on the, on the window or on the roof because it's just sort of cascades. And she's talking about domestic boredom. Um, you know, she's in a house in the kitchen and, you know, she's pontificating about time. Little bird, what do you hear? The clink of morning cheers, orange juice concentrate. Crossword puzzles start to grade. One across, four letter word, it's just not sitting. So, you know, you're sitting doing a crossword puzzle. Um, it's a Sunday afternoon, nothing's really going on. Little bird, where are they now? Daytime TV lounge, a carriage clock, a mantelpiece, a family wiped up, J cloth cleaned. Unsaid, festers in the throes of the sofa. Hinting at, you know, family drama or marital drama. Little bird, what can we do? A think tank, think rescue. Simon says, etch a sketch. Send a golden message only he would get. Quickly now, because this is not how it ends. Little bird, I just got one more question and I swear I'll let it rest. Little bird, where have you gone? I think it, it's, it's this, this playful, it's constructed in the, you know, more poetic um, or a childlike storybook, um, you know, little bird, um, let me talk to you. Let me pretend that this little bird is like this creature that I can speak to. And I, I do feel like it's like every bored housewife's um, uh, children's rhyme um, because it, it, it basically throws in all of these sort of allusions to domestic boredom or d domestic stagnancy, you know, especially um, if a marriage isn't working out um, or if family relationships are really torn, you know, this, this, this crumbling facade of this house that we live in or this nuclear family is falling apart. And the little bird, which symbolizes innocence, um, the beauty of that fairy tale romance um, and idealism, used to sit at my window and I used to speak to it and it would sing to me every day. Um, but now it's gone, and the love is gone. There's no more love in this house. I think it's just a beautiful analogy for a broken relationship. Or just also just being bored at home, you know? We all can relate to that. Um, a little bit first world problems, you know? You got this gorgeous house, but nothing to do. Do our crossword puzzles. Okay, Swoon is the other big pop song. I wish this had been a single, because it has an undeniable catchy chorus. Over a very percussive beat structure, I get that the idea of this song is kind of talking about um, overthinking or being too clingy in a relationship, um, possibly, you know, second guessing yourself, um, lacking the confidence because the other partner is not giving her what she's giving him and all she wants is him to start to swoon like she is. So there's this sort of frustration. Um, but it really kicks off with this energetic chorus after that energetic sort of playful um, verse style that's very reminiscent to some of her earlier music from Fru Fru. Let me be the great Scott, tip top pit stop in your ocean. I could be the shipmate's wife, got you down and dirty with the lotion. It's the funniest lyric. I, I don't really think too much about it, but I kind of take all of those sailing analogies to basically be like, can you trust me? Can you trust to ride this vessel with me through these waters? Um, let me be the great Scott. It's, it's a really funny um, anecdotal kind of lyric. I mean, she's very funny and witty with her lyrics. I mean, they will always make you smile or laugh because they're relatable and they're cheeky. The title is probably one of the most enigmatic songs in this record, along with one other that I can't wait to talk about. Um, through discuss, through leading the lyrics, I guess this really is just about true, pure love, possibly a love that feels, um, out of reach, um, you know, a love like you fantasize about in your head. Before electric light, you paddled through the soup of darkness as a crocodile, cherry picking in the river. I would leave crisp note footprints at the bank side. Watch it closely, you will see it begin to move. Watch it closely, you'll see it begin to flicker. And this song at this point does sound a lot like something that would have fit a lot on Speak For Yourself. It has that airy sort of um, swirly synthetic synthesizer backbone to it. Let's just see what happens, what we've got to lose while we're tidal and flexed on a full moon. It'd be a sure shame to not to. 
And then she does get a little bit more heavy metal where the electronica really comes in. This is one of the few moments where this album gets very heavy. And we have this electronic break breakdown where she ominously dictates, do what you feel just how you like, nobody has to know. And she repeats that quite a several times. She also sings, do it for England, um, do it for love, do it for us, do it for goodness sake. Um, and I thought the, I mean, obviously she's from England and I was like, why, why is this suddenly a patriotic thing? Um, because it, what does the England have to do with this? But I, I don't know. I, maybe she just wanted to give a shout out. I'm not entirely sure about that, but I thought it was very interesting. Um, and it is so true about, you know, nobody has to know what goes on in your mind and how and why you do things. If you just do them quietly, um, live your life. So there's a little bit of that existential kind of angst coming through on this song, making it broader and more enigmatic, like I said. Between Sheets is just a cute, blossoming romance type song. Uh, um, it speaks to, you know, on the honeymoon, you and me between sheets. It doesn't get better than this. It's a short, very sweet, chime-like song. Um, it has all the playfulness of, of all, all of her playful works. And it's on the surface because of that. And I don't really read into it very much more than that. It's sort of more of just like one really fun night and that sort of ecstatic swirl of it all. 2-1 is this very interesting song. I guess the 2-1 for the name, because at first I was like, what on earth does that mean? Uh, it's, it's very existential. You know, the lyrics are, um, you know, talking about creation and all of the gods lost two to one. Um, I think the title of this song is more referring to, you know, two versus one. So like you won two to one, just like, you know, you won five to six or sort of, sort of thing. It's the score. Um, she sings about, you know, all the gods lost two to one, two to one, a host from heaven pointed out to us from light years away. We're surrounded by a billion galaxies. I feel like she just watched a Neil deGrasse Tyson cosmic thing and just got really inspired to write this song because it goes to these big, broad, open cosmic questionings and philosophical things and just sort of leaves them there. Um, but, she, you know, in the chorus and the sort of big theme of this song is things are not always how they seem. They don't turn out always how we think. Will we be ready? This song is very earnest and a little bit dire, um, basically um, asking rhetorically, will we be ready? Well, are we ready for first contact? Imogen, are you talking about that? Um, it's true, things are not always how they seem. And, you know, there is more to this world than meets the eye. Um, if, you know, science tells us that what we can't see or touch or sense does not exist. But, you know, maybe there are senses that science does not know how to understand yet. So I see this song as also being a little bit like a, um, a homage to dark matter, which is stuff in the universe that um, science can't explain, but knows it's there because it's impacting things we can see. Um, so that's, you know, more getting into like astrophysics and stuff, which I'm very interested in. Um, I'm dying to know what's in your head, how we all got in this to help me make sense of it all. Also that existential confusion, like what, what does this all mean? Um, there's definitely a little bit of that crash after the party sort of thing. I mean, Between Sheets was so, you know, euphoric and present in the moment. And this song is so mournful and sort of lost and confused and forlorn, questioning everything. Bad Body Double is hilarious, and it's a really important song that she wrote because it talks about, you know, body image crisis. She sings about her bad body double, which is something we all can relate to, having a version of ourselves that's our, like, inner demon that keeps making us eat that cheese, even though we shouldn't eat that cheese, or makes us want to sleep in past, way past when we should get up, or, you know, uh, gives in to temptations when it shouldn't, or makes you say the wrong thing, especially when you're around someone where it really matters, and you're just like, I hate you, I'm gonna shut you down. Um, starting today, I'm gonna put you aside, I'm gonna lock you up. But you know, that little demon, it always comes back out and it always rears its ugly head and this happens to me all the time and it's so relatable. Um, and I do love how she talks about like, in sort of passive dictation and amongst lyrics, you know, um, you know, dimply thighs, a few extra weight, bits of weight on the side, I hear that stuff's a bitch to get rid of. It's it's just really fun and relatable. It's definitely one of the most upbeat songs on this album. I could have seen it being a, a single as well. I think it would have been really fun to see her kind of 
going around with sort of this like evil shadow puppet around her, like messing everything up, you know, at a dinner table. Um, Cause we all have that. We're not perfect. We all have instincts that run amok that aren't out always in our best interest. Um, we all behave erratically um, and we all give in to vices and temptation. Imogen does not uh, skirt around the image that, she, you know, she doesn't try to be this, you know, um, have it all together person. Um, you definitely, every time you hear her music, you get a sense of this is someone who doesn't have it together at all, has no clue what they're doing, is sort of just making stuff up on the spot. Um, and yet they're content with that. They've made their peace with that because that's how we all really are. No matter how much we may try to convince others otherwise. Aha! Very cute sort of uh, little, again, little interlude track. This song is very frantic and sporadic. She has this sort of operatic moments where her voice gets quite high and it gets a little grandiose and over the top. I think it's just sort of like a parody of itself in some ways. Um, eat, sleep, breathe. You're full of the stuff. Go bag it up, tie it up tight. We eat meat, dairy free, totally happy, clappy, high on life. You should try it, you know? Sort of like um, making fun of the over positive, like the hyper positivity of some people and how like the media like tells you about like what you in advertisements and stuff. Like this will give you happiness. It's happy, clappy, you know, everything is sunny and beautiful. Ah, got you now. Caught red handed in the biscuit tin. Cost you to keep me quiet. Oh, you fell for this again. It's sort of that, oh, come on. You, you, you knew that this was a ruse. You knew that this was fake, this magazine cover that made everything look beautiful, but you bought it anyway. You know, but you, you caught yourself red-handed once again because we all fall through that, like, illusion of, like, what the media gives us or, you know, something that just looks so good on paper but in reality isn't. It's the, the last word is oi, which I think is so funny. She's just like, oi. It's, it's really funny and cute. And you can tell she just was having a lot of fun in the studio when she wrote this one. Very converse to this song. So we have this nice little interlude called The Fire. I wish more artists did this because I do like sort of ambient interludes. And it's basically, you know, the crackling fire in a hearth or in a chimney um, and listening to it. And she just deftly on the keyboard just emotionally plays this beautiful short sweet melody that is you know um, accented by these silences and you just hear the fire crackling in the distance it's very reflective and contemplative and melancholy and it's so beautiful because of that and it leads us into like i said a song that dethrones hide, hide and seek for me um this actually did have a music video this song is called canvas the music video was filmed in Svalbard, which is in Sweden, by the Arctic Circle. It features this man carrying a canvas. It's a circular canvas. Um, and he's trudging through the snow, and he finally sits in front of a glacier, or more like an ice melt um, system, and starts to paint with black paint. Um, the song is called Canvas, and has some of the most enigmatic lyrics she's ever put to paper. But it starts out with this beautiful ambient interlude. There's a strumming guitar kind of carrying the melody. And there's just these beautiful sort of shimmery electronic sounds that sort of mimic like bird calls, owl calls. You see the snow. You can just feel it whirling all around you. Um, it, it speaks to a journey. It speaks to travel and mystery and being lost in the woods. And I do find it is more of a winter song, although I think the music video is largely, since I saw the music video when I first heard the song, it's sort of imprinted in my mind. I really recommend you see this music video. Imogen does not appear in it. Slow heart, dark weight, down love, black canvas, revolve within, you understand. Um, I mean, I will be contemplating these lyrics when I'm 90 years old because Every time I listen to it, I get different meaning from it. You know, it's like this structure of adjective and noun that don't seem to make any sense together, but strung all together, like so much in poetry will do, it beautifully kind of fits. Um, and she's a real poet. Fragile, earthware, cracks in the temperature, keep it cool to give, you understand. Once she finally gets to a chorus-like moment, she says, because I just can't find the strength to pull you up and keep you taut. So it could speak about a relationship, ultimately, you know, when she stopped beating around the bush with the enigmatic verses, she basically says, I can't do this anymore. 
But I read this as being so much more about like interpersonal relationships with one spirit, um, also a reflection on nature and humankind. Um, the more you look, the less you see. So close your eyes and start to breathe. Oh, you said yourself, this wasn't easy. Um, that sort of reassuring, like, yeah, this isn't going to be easy. Like, again, I do get this sense about like someone like an artist or a person about to set out on this daunting journey and they're taking a deep breath in and they're just, okay, this is going to be difficult. Um, when I go on this journey, I'm going to need to make sure that everything that's holding me down, I let go of. It's very like um, meditative because of that. It's such a beautiful song. Um, you know, if you're a part, if you're a painter, a lot of people either start with a white canvas or they start with a black canvas. Some people start with different colors, but you have, you know, your that backdrop where you put the first brush of new paint on. And so it's this, this trepidation about what to do next. Um, I have this canvas in front of me. What do I create? Well, all I know is that to create something beautiful, I had to let, let go of all this weight. I have to be in this sort of meditative state. And that's where this song takes you. And I think it brilliantly and yet at the same time, as enigmatically as possible, describes that feeling. Definitely my favorite song on this record. And I would list this as one of the, if I ever make a video that's basically like the 25 songs that changed my life, this song would be probably in the top 10. Because this song was one of those songs that just, it was one of the first Image and Heap songs I ever heard. And it really, it really made me fall in love with a lot of different things. It was just, it was life changing. The closing song, Half Life, is equally as bittersweet and beautiful. When Imogen is just softly in front of a microphone um, with slight vocal effects going on in the background, again, she doesn't heavily use the vocoder on this album, but you do hear it a little bit in plate parts and pieces. Um, this song kind of autobiographically describes the setting, but also is her asking, talking to herself in such a, you know, introspective way about a relationship that, again, it's not going anywhere. Um, it's a half-life um, with you as my courtier man, a daft life. Myself worth mentioning a text back tempo. It's been two days late. I always thought it was two days, eight minutes too slow, but it's actually two days late, minutes too slow. There may be, there may well be others, but I still like to pretend that I'm the one you really want to grow old with. You know, this fallacy of we're always going to be together, right? You always think this relationship could not possibly crumble, even if he's cheating. Um, you have to deconstruct that illusion and realize that um, you have to smell the roses. If he's cheating or if he's not giving you 100%, he's only giving you half, he's only giving you 50%, you need to get yourself out of that. And she also says it's a half-life with you as my quarterback. A tough life. Long for one last showdown from a box in a crowd, air compressed tight to explode. Here she does some of her beautiful um, descriptors where the sound starts to mimic the words. She really tries to make it sound like she's all compressed tight. I'm clenching my ticket to the only way out to disappear in a puff of smoke. And the song kind of just ends on this beautiful piano riff. Very, very... Um, mournful and reflective. Um, it, it, it speaks to a sort of more mature stance that I think this album comes from. This album arguably is a lot more mature than Speak For Yourself, even though Speak For Yourself is still so wise and mature. What can I say? I mean, Imogen is so wise. Imogen is so, you know, playful, but at the same time, so full of depth. Um, it's really hard to analyze these amazingly written lyrics. She's someone I'm really inspired by. And if I was ever to write music, I would definitely go to her songwriting, particularly her poetic style, as an influence because she's influenced a lot of my own poetry. I do like to write poetry. And the ways that she sort of almost goes with haiku formats, she does play around with different types of poetry formats. These songs would work beautifully as poems um, because of how abstract they are. They, they don't almost need the music, but the music adds so much more dimensionality to them that, of course, without it would be so much more lacking. Um, the soundscape, like I said, it's immersive. It's all around you. It's more warm, but it's also more close to the home, close to the heart, um, a little bit more melancholic and bittersweet, but it has its playful moments. 
Overall, I honestly feel like Ellipse is a stronger cohesive body of work than Speak for Yourself, but that's not saying Speak for Yourself is a bad record. I just really do have an emotional connection with this record, Ellipse, that makes it so much more powerful and memorable for me, partly because I heard it first before I heard Speak for Yourself, so that may have a little bit to do with it. Um, but boy, Imogen really is a quite an interesting musician, and I'd like to know what you thought in the comments about this record, especially the song Canvas, because that song, again, I'd be interested to know what your reactions and responses to that would be. I will review Sparks, which is her third album that she has released um, in the near future, and like I said, I have reviewed Speak for Yourself. I'll link that in the description. I hope you enjoyed this review of Ellipse. Thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful day. Bye.